I'm a simple man. I see Peanuts, my wallet is now empty. But in all seriousness, Peanuts has been a part of my life since I can remember. From reading the comic strip in the newspaper, borrowing Peanuts collections at the library, and also watching the specials on TV or the VHS copies of it. I've collected various books over the years, detailing the franchise from the comics themselves to even merchandise. But there was always one form of Peanuts media that had eluded me as a kid that I've only really gotten into more as an adult. Comic books. Now, this may sound silly, but I never really got into comic books as a kid. Sure, I'd borrow collections of comic books from the library, but never really sought out to buy actual comic books, with the closest being my subscription to the monthly manga anthology Shonen Jump as a kid. But Peanuts has quite a history with comic books. Today, the publisher Kaboom has released several Peanuts stories since acquiring the rights back in 2011. But some of the earliest Peanuts comic books appeared three years after the strip's debut in 1953. However, that comic book had just reprinted strips that were published up to that point. It wasn't until the mid-1950s that comic publisher Dell acquired the rights to Peanuts to produce original stories for the franchise. Dell Comics was a publishing company that was most well known for creating comic books based on pre-existing franchises such as Hanna-Barbera, Looney Tunes, and The Flying Nun, only the classics. The first Peanuts story to appear in Dell Comics was in Nancy number 146 in September 1957, and it was written and drawn by Charles Schultz himself. However, Schultz would contribute very little to the comics, mainly just drawing the cover art for certain Peanuts comic book covers. In fact, the majority of the story and the art all come from one individual named Jim Sasseville. Jim Sasseville was a colleague of Schultz when both taught classes at the Art Instruction in Minneapolis, Schultz's alma mater. The two were already working together on the short-lived comic strip It's Only a Game, a single-panel gag strip related to sports and the card game Bridge, when Jim was able to work with Dell on stories for the Peanuts gang. Jim Sasseville, alongside uncredited artists and writers at Dell, painstakingly recreated Schultz's art style, and to be honest, that hard work really paid off. The art style is amazingly well done for its time, and although nowadays it looks kind of goofy when you compare it side-by-side -side to actual Peanuts comic strips, Back then, I'm sure a consumer wouldn't have been able to tell the difference. It's that good. And the stories themselves, at least during the Sasseville era, I can see as being regular stories in Peanuts. They don't feel too outlandish or out of place at all, and a lot of them are really easy, enjoyable reads. Dell would continue to publish Peanuts stories in their various comics, such as Nancy, Tip Top, and occasionally in Fritzy Ritz, a comic for teenagers. But in 1959, Sasseville left to pursue other projects, and the comics were taken over by more art instruction colleagues, Dale Hale and Tony Pockernick. And while the art style remains relatively the same, the stories were starting to become a bit more outlandish, such as Charlie Brown and Lucy building a derby car that seems to change sizes every panel to a confusion between a weightlifting contest and a beauty contest. However, it didn't seem like Dale and Tony lasted for very long, as the duo left in 1960 and the remainder of the stories were left to in-house writers and artists. It was around this time too that Dell was starting to face declining sales and had to cancel several of their series, such as Tip Top and Nancy, or Nancy and Sluggo, as it was called at this point. In mid-1962, Gold Key Comics took over the publishing duties, but the quality continued to suffer until October 1963, when the final Peanut story was published. Dell Comics would limp along until closing down in 1974, and Gold Key Comics closing its doors 10 years later. Now, I normally would want to buy Peanuts comics off the internet, but have you seen these prices? Some of these prices go up to hundreds, even thousands of dollars, depending on the quality of the comic itself. Comic books have definitely become an investment for some, which is why some influential titles, such as Action Comics number 1 in 1939, can sometimes go for even millions of dollars. So, how can we, as a society, truly appreciate these old Peanuts comic books without having to shell out some change to get our hands on them? Well, in 2018, Kaboom released the Peanuts Dell Archive, which features every Peanuts story published by Dell and Gold Key. It's just a fascinating anthology of a rather obscure part of Peanuts history, and for $40, you get quite a chunky book that makes for a great read. I would recommend this book to anyone who wants to know more about Peanuts comic books and everything is preserved beautifully, and even credit Schultz, Sasseville, and Hale on the stories they wrote. And while we're in this book, why don't we pick out a few stories that really stand out. The first one is Clubhouse Blues, originally published in Nancy number 147. Lucy and now forgotten character Patty are building a clubhouse, 
which interests Charlie Brown as he walks by. However, Lucy says that he can only join the club if he can contribute to something, such as raising money. Charlie Brown suggests a benefit concert and... Okay, that Liberace parody is actually kind of cute. Or Liberace, as I used to call him. The kids ask Schroeder to perform at the benefit concert. And although Schroeder initially declines because he thinks it's too commercial, Lucy guilts him into it by saying that Beethoven would never turn down a benefit concert. They also use Snoopy to sit on Schroeder's Beethoven's bus so that he can stand out more. Their next challenge is to find an audience. Conveniently, Pigpen shows up and they ask if he wants to watch the concert as long as he donates money. Pigpen finds a quarter in his pocket and uses it to watch the show. As Schroeder is about to play a Beethoven piece, Pigpen boos Schroeder out of the concert since he wants rock and roll. Snoopy happily obliges, and the piano goes from a toy piano to a massive behemoth. Look at how huge it is compared to Pigpen. Charlie Brown is able to use the 25 cents to get a single two by four plank, in which Lucy uses it to write no boys allowed. It's a cute story, and definitely something I can see being done in an actual peanut story. But how about we change gears and take a look at what is probably the worst peanut story of all time, Mechanical Maniac, originally published in Tip Top number 221. I've already talked about this before years ago and... Here's Johnny! This was definitely the lowest point that Peanuts had ever been up to this point. But we may as well take a look at the story anyway. Lucy sees a small robot, thinking it's a child in a costume. Lucy tries to tell it that she's the boss, and after a brief hustle, she realizes that it's indeed a robot and not a small child. But the robot ties Lucy up in tape, and she sees Charlie Brown walking by with a remote controller of sorts. The robot, meanwhile, continues to wreak havoc on the neighborhood, such as taking Linus's blanket and grinding it up to dust. Schroeder then wonders who this robot is, to which Charlie Brown says it's his, and he calls him Gilbert for some reason. I mean, maybe one day he'll voice a couple of birds. Charlie Brown brags that it can do anything, including playing a piano piece. Schroeder doesn't buy it, saying that he put in no emotion, heart, or soul. Gilbert's butthurt response is to smash Schroeder's piano into pieces, to which all the kids affected by Gilbert become the most terrifying things ever shown in Peanuts, as they desperately want to murder Charlie Brown 26 years before it was an actual thing. And as the gang turns on Charlie Brown as he accepts this inevitable fate, he gets woken up by Schroeder. Yes, because what better way than to cop out of your crappy story is to say that it was all just a dream. It turns out that Schroeder was showing Charlie Brown his player piano, or as he calls it, a robot piano. Charlie Brown must have been so bored by Schroeder talking about this piano that he dozed off and somehow had a nightmare about owning a toy robot. That makes no sense whatsoever, but I'm not gonna dig into something that I would have paid a single dime for back then, so let's move on. The final one I want to take a look at is probably the best story out of all of them, and it was written by Charles Schultz himself. The Rainy Day, originally published in Nancy number 169. Featuring just Linus and Lucy, the siblings realize they forgot to bring an umbrella on the way to the library as it's pouring outside. Lucy has Linus go get the umbrella and that she'd wait for him inside. Linus leaves, Lucy goes back inside to read, Linus comes back asking what she said. Lucy says it again, Linus heads back out. Linus comes back in again, asking what color of umbrella she wants. Lucy kicks him back outside, and Linus goes and gets the umbrella and opens it inside. Bad luck, Linus. Bad luck. After nearly getting kicked out of the library because Lucy was shouting too much at Linus, Lucy asks for the umbrella. Linus retorts, saying that the only reason she would want it is because she can have it for herself since there isn't room under it for both of us. After giving Lucy that armor-piercing question, she gives an armor-piercing response by doing exactly what Linus thought she was going to do. I really like this story a lot, not just because it was written by Schultz, but also because the back and forth between Linus and Lucy is hilarious. I always thought that the two had the best sibling chemistry, tying with Drake and Josh. So to see the two be in their own story and no other Peanuts characters around, this is a perfect story. And I think that covers it for Peanuts comics. Maybe we'll look at some more in greater detail, Maybe get our hands on that one Peanuts comic book from 1953. If the price goes under $1,000, that is. 
but if you really want to read all the Peanuts comic books without having to break the bank or rob one, give this book a chance. It's $40 on Amazon, and you get a treasure trove of stories from an oft-forgotten part of Peanuts history.